take step one and two before step three. Next slide, please. Okay, so now to the core of the presentation. So the USMLE has been announcing some changes lately, and some of them have, can have many implications, especially for us IMGs. So these are things that we must keep in mind. Um, so the general changes, um, effective July 1st, 2021, the USMLE reduced its attempt number. What does this mean? So remember that if you pass a step exam, you keep that score and you cannot take it again. However, if you fail or if you don't show up because you felt like you were not ready, you can take it again. And before you could take it again six times, now this number is going to be reduced to four times. Um, this is not a dramatic change and keep in mind that if you feel like you're not ready, definitely either fail or not showing up is the best option because then you would be able to take it again four times. If you do pass with a bad score, you cannot take it again. Now the changes for step two, which are the most important changes. Um, October, 2020 the step one decided to increase the number of items assessing so questions that are assessing your communication skills as a doctor so this is going to include things like empathy patient privacy consent and also reporting and the second and the most important change for imgs is that after january 26 2022 so next year step one score reporting is going to be changing to pass or fail so you won't be getting the score if you take it right now this year you will be getting the score if you take it next year after january 26 then you will not be getting the score and this change has major implications especially for imgs because up to now imgs because we are in a bit of a disadvantage what we have to do is get amazing scores and so we would have on paper like, yeah, I didn't study in the US, I am an IMG, but I got amazing scores, I'm a great physician, and that was the most important thing for your application, getting amazing scores. If you get past or fail, this means that you lose a chance of proving your worth. Luckily, the step two is not gonna be changing this. We will still get a score for step two. So now most of the pressure is gonna fall under the step two exam. And so this leads to the changes in step two. So beginning November 2020, the step two decided to increase the number of questions assessing things like um, system-based practice, patient safety, legal and ethical issues, and professionalism. And the other change, and this one is also very important, is that before step two consisted in two exams. There was TK, so clinical knowledge, and there was also CS, so this is uh, clinical skills. So what you were assessed in up to CS was you showed up and there was an actor who was pretending to be a patient, and you would have to evaluate the patient, talk to the patient, communicate, and you were being evaluated as you were interacting with that patient. However, because of the pandemic, this was not safe anymore, of course, because with social distancing, it's not possible to be interacting with an actor. It's too risky. So when the pandemic started, step one, step two, CS was stopped. And then in January 2021, they decided to permanently cancel step two CS. So there will never be a step two CS again. And this is because other than the pandemic related issues, even before that, there were many questions about its usefulness. So first of all, pretty much everyone passed and did great. So really the outcome of that exam was not really getting any information or value to your application. Because everyone did pretty much the same and pretty much great. And the other concern was its burden for the medical students because it was only offered in five cities. So of course you had to travel there, you had to do everything you have to do when you travel. So organize your life based on that. And that's also a travel expense. So in the end, they decided to permanently cancel it. And right now it was replaced by another exam, which is called the OET or Occupational English Test. 
this is an international exam that's computer based. So there's no pandemic related social distancing issues. It's on a computer and it's an English proficiency test that assesses the language and communication skills of healthcare professionals. Next slide, please. So the other thing that happened beginning 2021, now that we don't have access to CS, is that the ECFMG has offered six pathways for IMGs to follow and to ultimately get their ECFMG certification. So pathway one, is for those IMGs who are already licensed in another country to practice medicine. So you already have a medical license in another country. So that, that means that you've taken some sort of exam that's equivalent to the USMLE in another country. So you apply for pathway one. You still have to take the USMLE in this place. Then pathway two is for those that have already passed a standardized clinical scale exam to obtain a medical license in another country, but they haven't obtained the medical license yet. Maybe they're halfway there. They haven't finished the process, but they have already started it. They have already taken an exam. Then pathway three, four, or five are pretty much the same. So it's when an applicant graduated from a medical school that's accredited by one of these agencies or committees. So you can find information about this online regarding your own university, or you can even talk directly with your university to find out if any of these agencies or committees is accrediting your university. And finally, we have pathway six. And this is for all of the applicants that don't apply to the previous five, or for those who have failed step two CS, the one that was canceled, and they failed it before it was canceled because you have it registered in your curriculum, basically. So keep in mind that you might apply for more than one pathway. So maybe let's say you were already licensed to practice medicine in your own country, but also you graduated from a medical school that's accredited by pathway three. So you apply for pathway one and three. In that case, you go for pathway one. So you always go for the first pathway, the highest one that you apply to. And the only exception is if you apply for pathway six. So basically, if you have failed step two CS, it doesn't matter if you are licensed in another country, it doesn't matter who accredits your school, you go for pathway six. And uh, having said that, I'm gonna pass the presentation to Stefan. Thank you, Antonella. So I am going to talk about uh, some upcoming changes to our journey. So first of all, the big change that will happen in the future in 2024 is change to recognize university. So what's this all about? The World Federation of Medical Education, from their experience, figured that not all medical universities, medical schools are the same and not they don't all provide the same type of education, same quality of education. So they decided to not accept all medical schools in their registry because up until, I mean, and it currently is like that, every medical school that's accredited by their country's agency is accepted and recognized by the World Federation of Medical Education. As of 2024, they will only be accepting medical schools accredited by agencies that are recognized by this organization. Meaning that the World uh, Federation of Medical Education has to recognize an agency that will accredit your school, that will your school accreditation to work and provide education. Uh, this, of course, is probably, of course, it's worse for us IMGs because some medical schools and their students won't be eligible for ECFMG certification. Uh, this is the current situation. So all dark blue countries are have recognized status. Their medical schools are accepted by ECFMG, YWF, and uh, all gray countries are not accepted currently. And the light blue countries are in process of getting recognized. So before we all start panicking here, because I know I was panicking when I saw this 
map for the first time. Uh, the thing is that this is just the current situation. So we'll have more information next year because WFME plans to provide us with the list in 2022 to provide us with the list of countries and medical schools that will be accepted and accredited by recommended agencies. So as of next year, when you search for your school in their database, you will notice that it will state if it's accredited by a recognized agency or not. Uh, also, there's some good news in all this. Now that we all know this, and we know it will, ECFMG will implement its changes of 2024, uh, everyone who applies for ECFMG certification prior to 2024 will do it under current rules. So if, if you apply, if you start your process with 41186 and everything, before 2024, or let's say you started now in a month, you will continue everything under current rules and your medical school will be accepted and represented. If you do it after 2024, who knows? Uh, there's some big thing for us IMGs here that's planning ahead. This is something that American medical graduates don't really have to do or don't really have to put much emphasis on, but for us, a bit different. So first, we have ECFMG certification. As Antonella mentioned, you have to uh, first with the ECFMG and then the USMLE. So first, you apply for the USMLE ECFMG certification number on ECFMG website, and you can have number pretty quickly in your email, and you can make your account. When making your account, now I don't know if I miss this or it doesn't stay anywhere, but I think your password shouldn't be longer than 12 characters. Mine was, and then I couldn't log in. So just keep an eye out for all those little rules because then you have to call them and that's all. Uh, after that, you can apply for certification. So you apply by downloading and handing out form 186, paying the certification fee, scheduling the notary. This, they use notary camp. Now, not every camp agents are pretty nice. They will schedule your, uh, they will schedule you right away or as soon as possible. You don't have to worry that much about that part. This is a pretty straightforward process. It lasts all about two weeks, so it's pretty quick. Now, when you apply for US MLEs, no matter if it's step one or step two, first, of course, you do the online application. Then you have to pay the fee, which we'll talk about later. And this is the big wait. You have to wait for ECFMG to verify your status. So what does this mean? This means that EC ECFMG will contact your medical school to verify if you're a student or graduate of that medical school. They can do it in two ways. They can do it online or through form 183. This is determined by your medical school. So when you're applying for your study, the last page you see after you finish application, it, they will tell you how they will verify your status. So it will say your school has chosen the online mode of verifying status or the paper form to verify your status. Uh, the next thing I would advise you to do, or probably prior to this, is to find out if your school to ask around and see who's in charge of these applications. Uh, because you want that person's contact, so you can have contact with them when the application arrives. For my application, it took about a month and a half, almost two months, for ECFMG to contact my school. After which, the register contacted me to tell me that I need to pay some extra fee to my school because they need to provide my grade transcript to the ECFMG. So just keep that in mind. And after that all is done, uh, pretty quickly you'll get your USMLE number to schedule your test, and then you can do it on the Prometrics website. So. All in all, this process takes more than a month. For me, it took two months, and keep that in mind when you're applying for it. You want to start, I mean, probably try to do it like six months in advance so you have another four months to schedule your test and everything. Okay, and uh, the next thing we want to think about is some restrictions. Now, when you're scheduling your test, it's good before you start the entire process, and that would be my advice to this as well. If you can't have the test in your own country, you know, find it, go on the Prometric website and find out where is the closest place you can schedule it at, at what time, uh, what openings do they have, and so on. So that you can plan this part ahead, because you want to plan your travels, your stays, 
uh, visa restrictions if you have any, and especially now with COVID-19. So for traveling, I would advise you to come a day or two earlier. Of course, you don't arrive on the day of your test because you're in a foreign country, you want to map out, find out where the parametric center actually is. Um, also, you have to calculate the, where you're going to stay and how much money it will cost you. Uh, now, for this year, as it was for last year, and hopefully that won't be the issue next year, it's COVID-19. Uh, that's a big thing because we can't really predict which countries will implement restrictions, which country will completely close off their borders or something like that. So what you want to do is schedule your test and in this manner, basically hope for the best. When you schedule your test, the last year, what they did when countries closed off their borders and implemented restrictions, uh, ECMG and Prometrics allowed students to reschedule their tests. Now this can be a good thing or a bad thing, of course. If you're prepared for tests, I mean, you don't really want to study the extra two or three months, but in this case, you might have to. Uh, one thing we all need to plan about is budgeting. So first of all, you have $150 to pay for the initial certification to start the entire process and for what it takes. Then you have $975 for each step. So that's 975 for step one and 975 for step two. And you have, if you're not doing it in, in the United States, you have international test delivery surcharge, which is 180 to $200, I think for Europe, for me, I think it was 200 but it's pretty similar price. And of course, there are other unforeseen expenses, travel accommodation visa. So as I said, plan ahead, see how much everything will cost you, because you have to go to another country, you have to stay there for a couple of days, you have to eat something and return to your own country. Uh, luckily for our budget is that step two CS was cancelled because that was probably the most expensive one as it required us to travel to the United States, stay there, there, go back to our countries and that's it. Okay, and uh, that's it for my part and I would like to give words to our guest, Hamza. Thank you, uh, Stefan and Antonella, and thanks everyone for joining. Um, my name is Hamza Kandil. I'm from Jordan. I graduated uh, from Jordan University of Science and Technology, and I currently work as a question writer at Osmosis. Uh, now, for me, I did my step one and step two, and currently I'm preparing for step three, and I will be giving a few tips and advices for you, as well as some resources to help you prepare. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so before I start, I know that everyone has their own way of studying and I'm not here to tell you how to study, but just a few tips on how to prepare well, that might be helpful for you. And uh, I'll start with saying, don't use many resources in your preparation. Just stick to a few that you feel comfortable with. We will talk about resources in a bit and um, stick to them, you will be very good. Don't distract yourself with uh, so many resources. Also, I think that it is better always to study according to your own schedule and make sure that you take breaks one or two days every couple of weeks to avoid burnout because it is a long journey. Um, also, I want to mention a little bit about assessment tests like MBMEs or reward self-assessments. I think they are very important. You have to do them to see where you're standing and um, know if you have any weaknesses, what weaknesses do you have, and see your progress in the subsequent tests. Also, one other point about the assessments is that it's not just an assessment tool. It's basically also a learning tool. And after you do each and every one of these exams, make sure that you study each question, both right or wrong, and especially for MBMEs. I think this might be a very important step in your preparation to reach your goal. And um, one last point I want to mention is about radiographic images, like chest X-rays, CT scans. Um, most of us know that you will have plenty of these in your exam. So start early with to familiarize yourself on how to interpret these images so that when you encounter them, you will be comfortable to uh, interpret the question. Now, the resources I'd recommend, first of all, Osmosis. Um, we worked hard on creating a comprehensive study tool with for step one and step two and at whichever, whichever level you are. For example, if you're in the beginning, in the middle, or at the end, 
we have great explanation videos. We created like the review material uh, for step one and step two, which are really good for the exam. And we're working on a, like a very big question bank, basically covering almost every topic and with questions that mimic the real exam and help you prepare. Of course, first aid reward and then BMEs as mentioned. And Pathoma, especially the first three chapters, I think they are very good. Hasadar made a very good job explaining them and it contains many high yield topics. Finally, some additional resources you may use include Sketchy, Online Medded. Now, I didn't use them myself, but plenty of people that I know did, and they recommend them. And um, we're done here. Uh, thank you for joining everyone. And now we'll go to Antonella for questions. So thank you so much, Stefan and Hamza, for joining me. I think the presentation was very good and very enlightening, even for myself, as we're all in this process together. So I've been tracking some of the most repeated questions. And one of the questions that's very repeated is about the visas. So I want to say that really um, visas are a very complex topic. So we strongly encourage you to utilize sources online. We're not experts in visa, we are doctors, but Stefan can give you a lot of information about the visa because he has already done some applications and research in that regard. So what we can tell you is that basically for J1 and H1B visa, so J1 is sort of it like a academic exchange visa where you're allowed to come to the US, learn, of course, which is your residency, and then by the rules of J-1 visa, you should return to your own country for at least two years. Now, there is a J-1 waiver, which is available for doctors. So instead of returning to your own country, you get to work in the United States for a year in an area where they are lacking doctors. From my research, can be anywhere from New York to Alabama. There is no rules to it. And it's a bit more difficult to transition from J-1 visa to the green card. This is because a J-1 visa is like one intent visa. So what you plan to do on a J-1 in theory is to come to the U.S., study, go back to your own country. That's how that visa works. Of course, there is the waiver, which will allow you to stay in the U.S. And after that, you can get a proper work visa and continue your life in the U.S. Uh, now, for the H-1B visa, that one is a bit, uh, let's say, better for us IMGs, but it's a trickier to get. J-1 visa is sponsored by ECFMG, and all IMGs can get it. So everyone who gets residency can get J-1 visa. H-1B visa is sponsored by the institution or hospital you are doing your residency at. Some sponsor them, some don't. If they do, it's great for you to get uh, H-1B visa because that's so-called a dual intent visa. It means that you, with that visa, you plan maybe you'll go to your country, maybe you'll stay in the U.S. And it's a lot easier and more natural to transition to the green card from H-1B visa. So if you are in a position to do step three before your residency and before applying to, the, to get the visa, and if you're in a position to get a hospital to sponsor H-1B visa, I would recommend it. I do plan to do it for myself as well. Thank you so much, Stefan. So there's a lot of questions regarding things like failing, when to take the exams, which ones are required for the US. Okay, so first of all, if you fail a step exam, it shows on your record. So it's better to not go to the exam than to go and fail. If you're not ready, don't go. Because if you then don't fail but pass with a bad score, then you cannot take it again. So the order of the worst outcomes would be, first of all, passing with a bad score. Because that remains in your record, you cannot take it again. Then failing. Because yes, you can take it again and get a great score, but your record will always say that you failed once. And then not showing up. That's the best thing if you don't feel comfortable. So some people are also asking, like, if you're not 
if you don't feel ready, should you take it? Definitely no, it's better. Or if you don't have enough time, because maybe, for instance, in my case, I work at osmosis all day, and then I'm studying at night. So what I'm going to do is I am taking step one next year so that it's pass or fail, just because I know I don't have enough time to get the best score ever. So there's no shame in that. If you don't feel like you're going to do great this year, then it's better to take it next year. Then some people are asking if your scores expire. Yes, in seven years. So definitely take your time. Study as much as you need. Like, take your time. But don't take longer than seven years because that is really expire. <laughs> but other than that, take your time. And seven years for three exams is... Is, should be more than enough. And some people are asking if in this case now you need the OET since we don't have step two CS. And yes, you need the OET to apply for residency. And some people are then asking, do you need step three? No, you don't need step three to apply to residency, but you do need it eventually before you finish your residency. So at a certain point, you're going to have to take step three. If you can take it before applying, then that's amazing because that gives you extra points in your, like not actual points, but it, it's like a bonus. You look great because you can, apply, you can practice medicine without supervision. It looks great in your application. But if you're not ready, if you're not going to do well, then in that case, you can take it during your residency. And the diff also the other difference is the visa thing. So if you take step three before residency, you can apply for an H-1B visa. If you take step three during residency, then you are under the J-1 visa. Uh, there's I'm also... I'd like to yeah, add that there's one more thing you can think about here. If you do step three before your residency, then you have nothing to study for during your residency except for your residency for it. But if you don't take it, then besides doing your residency, studying for it, you will have that burden of studying and doing step three. So that's also something to think about which you can manage. Yeah, definitely. So that's something that's good both for you and for the hospital that's taking you. They take that into account because they know that if you have to take step three, you're going to be busy studying sometimes, while if you don't have step three, if that's out of the way, then you're totally available to just focus on learning during your residency. So they do take that into account, definitely. Now, I think there's a question more specifically for Hamza, who is a bit further along in the process. So many people are asking, like, how to stand out during electives or interviews and how to do like really well during the steps. Okay, uh, I wanted to mention one thing about the steps, about being prepared. And I think this is where you trust your MB, your self assessments. You have to do self assessments to see if you're prepared or not. Now, you want to stand out, I think, um, the difference now with the step one and step two. Previously, it was step one, the load on it, and how to get in a score. And I read some people asking what is good or what is bad score. Generally, above 230, 240 is considered good. Uh, now, the load will be on step 2CK. Uh, usually, the scores are higher in step 2CK, but make sure you prepare well. I believe that doing step one before step two will improve, will be helpful for you. Um, how to stand in electives, and uh, I don't know if it's uh, resumed or not, or you can do electives now. Um, to stand out in elective, you, you have a few basic like roles. First of all, you have to show the earliest and leave the latest. You have to be there every day, don't make excuses, don't argue. You have to keep learning and uh, try as, as much as you can to show interest. In whatever you are doing, show interest, read about the for example, if you're doing surgery, read about the operations you're doing, practicing, uh, learn more. Every time you get asked a question, read about it. And I think it's very important in the electives because you will have a letter of recommendation and that can stand out in your application. They really pay great attention to letters of recommendation and it can grant you interviews. Now, in interviews, uh, you have to be very well prepared, but you have to be yourself at the end of the day. Be genuine and... Um, 
you will be great. Most of the time it is easy. Some people tend to um, like complicate it, but I think that in, in the interviews, be genuine, answer honestly. And of course, if you're interested in a, in a certain area, it will show. Thank you so much for that answer. I'm seeing some questions regarding the colors in the map. Um, so for instance, gray on the map, blue on the map, if that's gonna change. So the map that Stefan showed is the current situation. Thank you. Um, this is the current situation right now. This can change. For instance, the dark blue colors might become gray. We don't know what's gonna happen because there's so many changes going on. Then the lighter blue colors are the ones that are applying. So they haven't been approved. They haven't been rejected. They're kind of in a middle situation. So those will most likely change either to dark blue or to gray. Um, this, remember, is something that is going to be applying since 2024. So right now, none of this exists. All the countries are fair game. So if you are one of those countries that is right now gray in that map, that means that you should take the exams before 2024 because you can right now. And after 2024, you might not be eligible anymore. Let's see, I'm looking at some more questions. So there's some questions regarding the implications of step one becoming cost or fail. So as I was saying earlier, basically, Oh, there's a question asking if it's going to be harder. It's going to be the same questions, just you won't know your score. Maybe you did great, maybe you did not that great, but you will never know your score. So the main implication is for IMGs. So as IMGs, especially if we want to get into a very competitive residency, you could get a super great score in, step, in the steps. And then show your scores and be like, this is why I'm so great and this is why I should take it. If there's pass or fail, there's no way of saying, hey, look at how great I am. Because everyone just says pass. Um, so it depends on how ready you are. If you feel like you can ace it now, you are super ready now, take it now. Because you're going to get that amazing score that you studied for and you can show it. Even when it becomes pass or fail, if you have a score, you can still show it. Like it's gonna show in your record. It's not like next year all the scores of the world disappear. It's only the ones that take it next year, they won't appear anymore. And also remember, even if you take it next year, we still have step two, CK, where we can get an amazing score. And that's actually more of a clinical exam. So that one is more reflective on why you are a great doctor, because that's more like diagnosis, treatment, um, that's one of the reasons why step one was turned into pass or fail. People, people were putting so much pressure on step one. And step one is really very like molecular, very like details. It doesn't, yes, it speaks of your knowledge, but it doesn't really speak of what kind of doctor you are actually with the patient. So that's why to stop it from having so much pressure, it became pass or fail. And now all of the pressure will fall into step two mainly. And of course, your application. You can make your application stronger, even if you took it in pass fail and you don't have that going for you. Like, look at my amazing, like my amazing score. At that point, you have to go for clinical rotations, letters of recommendations, as, as I'm sort of thing. And an important thing is if you can get letter of recommendations from a doctor that's working in the US that's very important and they take that into account. So if your letter of recommendation is from a doctor that's from another country, they might not take it into account as much. So definitely try to get contacts here, um, a rotation here if you can find that it's amazing and the letter of recommendation, of course. Let's see, I'm looking at some other questions. So about the program interviews being virtual and if that's going to change, we don't really know if that's going to change right now. It's virtual and that's both a good and a bad thing. So a good thing, because we can all apply and have an interview from our home. We don't have to travel, et cetera. But that means that last year there was a record of how many people applied because anyone 
from their house, from their country, from their continent could have an interview. So it's both good and bad. I, I, I think most of good because we all get a chance at this point. We don't have to specifically travel for that interview or travel to take that step to TS. Okay, there's some information about like forms and more visa stuff. I would recommend that you speak with your university because every university and every country has different um, things, different requirements, different um, committees that are um, associated to your medical school. So definitely those are questions that you should address directly to your university because every country is different. And we are all from different countries, even me, Savan, and Hansa. So it's different. There's questions about doing research and published papers. I think that's definitely good. It's even better if you have a clinical rotation. But if you don't like get to find a clinical rotation, especially now that with COVID, hospitals are very overwhelmed. They not might not be taking um, students for a, a shadowing or an observership. So in that case, if you can find a research, if you have published papers, that's amazing that's always a plus and having a clinical rotation is even better and that will get you the recommendation letters as well Hamza if you have something else to add uh, sorry yeah about uh, virtual rotations I've seen so many questions about it uh, I wanted to uh, I'm not sure about it I didn't experience it uh, um, but I think it is good Research is very good. If you can publish papers, yes, of course, it is going to add to your CV. Anything can add to your CV, yes. Clinical rotations in the U.S. is the best because, believe it or not, they, they trust it is from the U.S. So you have U.S. clinical experience. Uh, it's going to really be very valued. Um, you cannot, you can do a, valid, a, a virtual one, then go for it. Research also increases your chances. Anything that really can boost your CV is going to be helpful. Okay, so we're looking at a lot of repeated questions right now. So I wanted to let you know that we're working on updating our ultimate guide that will have all of this information summarized and it will have all of the content you need easily, like easy to scan and to find. So stay tuned and we're going to release that after this meeting, hopefully this week or next week, once that's ready. And um, let's see if there's any other different questions. So I think that's all of the questions. There's a lot of repeats. And as I was saying, we're going to, we have this video recorded, this webinar. And we're going to be updating our ultimate guide and we're going to be sharing it with all of you so that you can also share it with your colleagues and with everyone. So thank you so much for joining. I think this was great even for myself. I learned so much. So thank you, Stefan and Hamza, for joining me for this webinar. And hopefully we'll have a future webinar when we're done with this set to let you know how it went. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Thank you, everyone. It was really nice to see so many of you and from all over the world because we're basically in this process together. Recording stopped.